I'm a professor at the University of North Dakota, so I, I coach the UND Airback team. Um, active in the collegiate thing. We got our MCU guys. So go collegiate program. Um, I instruct in aerodynamics, aircraft systems, human factors, and then my favorite is I teach a single credit uh, elective aerobatic course, and then we go have fun with aircraft. So um, that's a little bit of the background. Now with talking about flying the decathlon, um, it's the perfect airplane because it'll do a little bit of everything. It is not the best stole aircraft, but you can land it off field no problem. It is not the highest performing aerobatic aircraft, but it will fly very well in competition. And for a cross-country aircraft, it goes a little bit faster than a Cessna, slightly faster than an Archer, climbs better, and there's enough room to throw bags in the back, which is unlike most aerobatic aircraft that we've got on the field. So it's a little bit of everything. But with that being said, then, there's a lot of different places that we could take the presentation. If you want to talk about aerobatics and competition, because this is IEC, you want to talk about just flying the aircraft and some different characteristics in general, we can do that. So with interest uh what's one's plan the aerobatics yes that one all right perfect uh, so a lot of different things we can look at but yeah we'll we'll focus on the aerobatics i've got one from training camp that was uh john morrissey saying here's how to do a landing just watch the video I'm like all right cool so with my background as mentioned um i was a top u.s pilot at the advanced competition in 18 in Romania, we took a fifth overall uh, in the world, and then that got the team a second place finish with I think myself, Air McCartan, and AJ Wilder uh, taking the top scores. Uh, a lot of those, my fellow competitors, are now flying in the Unlimited team, which is why they're not here uh, enjoying Oshkosh. So we're missing Jeff Bourbon and Rob Holland and Aaron McCartan and uh, um, AJ Wilder, and I'm trying to remember the last two because I can see them and I know their names. It's, I just can't see the rest of the photo. Um, but they're, they're flying in Poland right now, and I think the competition starts in a couple days. They're finishing up training. Um, like I mentioned, I head coach the aerobatic team, 10-time collegiate champion, um, assistant professor, and then I did win intermediate at nationals last year flying a super decathlon. So we'll take it as far as it can go safely. Um, so plan, we can look at the aircraft a little bit, but many of you are familiar, but we'll talk about some of the differences between the different models, or if you've got questions with performance, um, so I've been feeling a few questions about why does yours have spades because ACA says you shouldn't have spades on it like that's the new wing That's that's why ours have spades the old wing has spades um, and some different things like that But overall I mentioned the decathlons uh, uh, outgrowth of the champ If anyone's familiar with the champ, it was designed to beat the cub in three things <laughs> it's Supposed to be well you can solo it from the front unlike a J3 so you can see over the nose visibility supposed to be better it's a little more stable on landing so between the champ and the cub they're kind of the basis of how squirrely a tailwheel airplane is and it's easier to get into and out of but for those flying decathlons the easiness is questionable but it is slightly easier than a cub um, and they're successful and that uh, grew into the Cetabria which then grew into the decathlon so we've now got a semi-symmetrical airfoil on it um, which I think it works out to about a degree, and then there's a degree and a half of angle of incidence. The newest ones are aluminum spar, but there's a lot of wood spar out there still as well that fly very well. Uh, and all of them that I'm aware of are at least rated to positive six and minus five. So they went a little bit beyond the FA in the negative side, but unless you're going really fast, it's hard to get much past negative three, and it's really uncomfortable. So most people don't want to do that anyway. Um, a couple of prohibited maneuvers. So no alum shavox or tail slides. There are of technically faking those. I know Greg Coots and his air show, that's kind of a Lumshavak. It's an, a, a really slow speed outside snap. Lumshavak. And then uh, uh, the tail slide, you can kind of whip stall it, but you can't go backwards. Uh, that tends to hurt the uh, elevator on it. Where they pair up, it'll start twisting them, and then you end up with a, a mess. So, uh, so a couple of prohibited maneuvers and limitations for good reason. More power. When you look, the, the normal Super D is looking at 180 horsepower fuel injected with a constant speed prop, two minutes inverted, but if you're leaned out at high altitude, you can sometimes get more out of it, although they don't recommend it. Uh, if anyone's ever, anyone ever pushed down for how long? Yeah. It'll do almost three minutes, and then it'll sputter, and then you go back upright. Um, with the inverted system, it's set up where it does have a standpipe that's slightly lower in the tank. So when you're inverted, it'll drain out faster, or not faster, but you'll run out when you go upright, it'll have fuel again. 
and then it'll fill, I think, the tank in about 20 to 30 seconds back to, to full on the header tank. So you're limited to two minutes at a time. Um, but if you want to fly a cross-country inverted, not on a Victor Airway, then <laughs> you can, just in brief moments. Uh, and then it's got the wet sump oil system that we're fairly familiar with. Now with the different upgrades and over time, um, start with the fixed pitch with a 320 and 150 horsepower. Very light. So th those have good performance. All of them have good performance, just in different ways. Uh, the Super E that I'm more familiar with is the 360 or the IO360 with 180 horsepower. And the new Extremes uh, have the 390 at 210. Is anyone flying Extreme? Look at that. How do you like it? The power is nice. And the roll rate is nice. Uh, with that, uh, all the new ones they've upgraded the wings on. So now we've got, uh, without that um, panel that tends to lose screws out of it, uh, you don't have the gap seal. And with flying it, when you get into aerobatics, the gap seal itself, there's a, a I can't remember if it's felt or like a rubberized material that's between the, the wing and the aileron that's attached to the aileron. That's important. I've had one of those come off once, and it, they roll like, I was getting upset in the aircraft. They, they don't roll very good all of a sudden. Um, as the speed builds up, it, you just can't. It's like take two hands to hold it. It's really bizarre. Even though you got space, it doesn't matter. So that gap seal becomes important. But they were able to remove all of that with the new style of wing. And it does get an extra 20 to 30% roll rate out of it, which is effective. It's not a blistering roll rate as it is. I got that. Uh, that one rolls faster than, and that's the old style, the green one I've got out front for UND. Um, we've got two of them. They roll different rates, even though they're the ex otherwise identical. There's one's a 2006, one's a 2010. Uh, but with flying competition, I sometimes borrow uh, Sarah Arnold's and Swanson's airplane, and that's a 78 that's got the Trailblazer prop on it and the new wings, and it makes a big difference. It, it does a lot. Um, so those things type of help. So we do have the extreme style ailerons, uh, no gap seals anymore. They, I think they say it saves about 20 to 30 pounds off the wing, and you don't lose the screws because there's no screws. <laughs> You don't have to worry about the, the, the rubber on that gap seal anymore. So that's, it goes away. And they do roll faster. The difference, though, is they are heavier. Um, so when you're flying, if you're going maximum, there's a, a little bit of a breakout force. So they're heavy in the center, and they are a little bit heavier than the normal Super Decathlon. So depending what speeds or what maneuvers you like to fly, you may or may not like them just because they are a little bit heavier. But they do roll faster, and they'll roll faster at lower speeds. Uh, then we get to the engine stuff. So we went from fixed pitch, and then we've got our, our different variety of props that are on it. Um, if I had to own one, I wouldn't put as many hours on it as the school does, so I'd be totally fine with an MT. Um, they are very light. Uh, I've flown both a two-blade and a three-blade, but after around 700, they start getting messy. Um, some mileage varies on when the grease seals go. The, uh, the metal prop, that's what we put on ours. They were making fun of us for a while. Why would you put a metal prop on a new one? It's so much lighter with the MT. It is, but I've never had an issue with the, the metal Hartzell. Um, the one issue I had was after an overhaul, and they rolled the seal by accident. Uh, so it spit grease on flight number two, and then we sent it back, and then it came back perfect, and we haven't touched it since. So, so those are fairly indestructible. The, uh, the Trailblazer Claw, though, will get you a lot of extra power at the low speed and being able to accelerate out of things. They claim there's a, a slight boost on top speed, like maybe a knot or two in cruise, um, but you'll notice it a lot on the acceleration. They do accelerate very well. So they've been putting those on, uh, I think the Denali and the Scouts uh, for a lot of the, the short field performance, but they help out when we're trying to maneuver as well. So we've got those things going on. And then we've got different types of style. So now we can talk about flying. So what type of styles everyone want to fly? Or what, what's your goals? Going up, having fun? Sportsman? I, oh, I was going to pull up a, oh, I have, I'll pull a video for sportsman too, because I got a couple of my students going through it. I try every couple of years to make a video of going through every sequence, and I didn't this year yet, because it's been tricky with time. And we've had interesting weather in North Dakota. I don't think spring started till about two weeks ago. Uh, and then it went straight to 100 degrees in the summer. So it's, <laughs> um, but with different ways, you know, we've got smooth flying that we can work on. And you're typically looking, you know, aileron rolls and loops and, and G loads. And then we can look at the competition style and how to make things a little bit more 
crispy and gain energy throughout the maneuver. Because a lot with the decathlon, the beauty of it is that if you learn that and perfect it, you can transition to any of the other aircraft and it's a transferable skill. Um, it doesn't always work going backwards, but it is a lot better rolling than a Tabria. So <laughs> this Tabria sometimes hang up when you get past knife edge if you use too much control. But we can talk about getting out of things too and, and how to make maneuvers work as well. So the competitive edge really comes from energy management, and I'll show some videos about that. Um, spins are predictable. Uh, with competition, when you talk to different pilots, they'll have different styles of how to get into things. I usually joke with everybody that uh, I've, I've flown extras, I've flown the Panzel. I do dumb things to make them look like the decathlon spinning. Um, everyone wants to look like a decathlon when it spins because it's very straight, it's very classic. So they'll always tell you, no, no, you need to use aileron for the spin, and then you got to do this, and then do this weird stuff to flatten it, and then add power, and then take it out. And like, no, just power back, stick back. Before it stalls, basically our friend is the stall horn because it's always on. Um, you know, you hit the stall horn, count to about three, and if you don't have it or have it turned off, then right before you buff it, find that speed. Rudder goes in, and as the wing drops, stick comes back, and it goes, Whoop, and then it looks perfect, and then stopping is this rudder and stick. Um, and there are a few eccentricities with how to get the stop actually vertically down um, and how to blend it, so we can discuss those a little bit too. But we should check out some video and look at just flying and how to make it, how to make it work, and then where do we gain energy from? So I have... Let's see, getting through, I got rollers. I have advanced. Point rolls. Oh, I got the air venture arrival. Where'd my other video go? I'll find it in two seconds. I apologize. I thought I had them all prepped last night because I was going through all the video. But we'll find my friend Flying Sportsman because uh, it's right here. Um, so on practice, let's see, it should be this video. Oh, no, this one's going to be, that's fine. I don't want to do the feedback. There we go. Um, oh, Seaward Contest. This will be a good one. Uh, should have been right. So uh, I've got a 360 video that I use for training. For posting video, they kind of look a little bit goofy because they are not the cleanest um, for making the, the video work. But it gives you a ton of options for training because then you can see exactly where everything is happening. Uh, so we'll play with the screen a little bit. This is one of my students flying sportsman. It's Andrew when you find Andrew. He, he, everyone knows, you guys know Andrew. And my mouse thinks it's to the right. So there we go, we'll zoom out a little bit. So this is kind of the advantage of, of playing with the 360 video is if you want to check altitudes, you can check altitudes. If you want to check your speed, depending on where you stick it, you can check your speed. If you want to see what your flight controls are doing, there's a stitch, so you have to align it. Um, but this helped with training for the advanced team. I could find out what was going on all the time and making things work. So let's see. Hey, we're going to rock the wings. This one is, looks like a practice. So I think we're going to run through the, I got to see what card he has. If he's got a freestyle or a sportsman. This one is... I can't read it. Oh, this one's a freestyle. I go back to the other video. We were practicing with Humpty Bump. Oh no, wait. Yeah, this here starts with Humpty Bump. No, this is a, this is the known. Okay. Yeah. So first one's a Humpty Bump. The uh, the challenge with the Humpty Bump is making sure the timing is accurate. You need to get a vertical, and it will do a vertical, but you don't, don't want to get too slow. And then they're a fun maneuver to do. Uh, so the, the trick is finding a good vertical. And then we've got the second trick. Uh, who's a judge? Anyone judges or familiar with judging? Or the, no one wants to admit it. It's OK. Yeah. It, the, the grade is on the zero lift axis of the wing. But depending on how the paint job on the airplane is, and the wing has an angle of incidence, sometimes if you go just barely past, it lines up with the line of the aircraft better, and it looks a little bit better. But if you roll on a vertical, that's going to put you off. So um, on the Fly Cool Things podcast, we were joking about that with flying. It's like, how do you fly the vertical? I'm like, well, I, 
if if I'm going to fly a straight vertical like the Humpty, I go a little bit past because it lines up with the fuselage and it grades well. If I need to do a roll, I'll line up with the wing, and then when you roll, it squares up and everything looks perfect, and then it, it'll grade well because it clearly rolled around the wing and everything was fine. Um, that's thinking too hard. Just get it close initially and it'll be fine. Um, but sighting devices help, or if you don't have one, you know, putting that, that uh, lift strut line that's right here, or there's that, that bar in between, put that perpendicular and that'll work out. You can check the bottom of the wing. It's a little off, but it gets you really close. Um, but hit vertical. Give it like maybe a, a two count at most, really fast two count. And then when you bump off, it, you're doing the first part of a loop. So you end up, make sure it's off the line and then try to let it float. And then as the aircraft accelerates to the inverter part, you got to pull really hard. So I pull it almost to the, the stall point because it's a stick position about an inch off the back wall. So you pull it almost to the firewall and let it hook around. It feels really dumb when you do it in the aircraft, though, that way, because it feels like I'm like I'm floating and then uh, wah, I'm hooking it. And so it feels like you did this. Um, but as the aircraft accelerates, it's just like a steep turn or, or a loop. The faster you go, the more change you need. So it looks really good, but it feels really dumb from inside the aircraft. And that's some of the problems we sometimes have with judges and things it's like it felt great. It looked good. I'm like that device. And you're like, yeah, the device wasn't on, though. <laughs> So ground critique ex helps out immensely for this. And then uh, once you get through, then find your spot. At this point, I'm not looking at the wing at all. I'm looking at the ground. And then that, um, when you're flying a high speed level, where the horizon cuts through, pause for tri-motor, where the horizon cuts through the, the windscreen, that ends up being your aim point for vertical down or, or that spot you're targeting for, or for the 45s as well. It's really easy to look at the spinner and then you're five degrees off on things because you're rotating around, the, you're look, you have to look down and you're rotating around the wrong point. So even just a few of those tips and tricks for anything from this to the Cubans or any of those, it's just finding that sight picture when you're, you're rolling around. That's the one when you're level you gotta look for. And that's a little bit different when you're inverted, but we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So we got, uh, first up, we got our our, uh, our Humpty Bump done. Then into the 45, I usually drive it till we're slow. And then we can fly really good slow flight. So make sure there's a line between that and the spin, the 45 up. But there's our spin and a half. And I'll go through that one another time, uh, just because things happen rather fast, especially if I can find my mouse. Um, so there's our 45 up. Nope, that's actually the last part of the Humpty Bump. That's fine. Stallhorn is our friend. Ours goes off really early in this airplane. <laughs> well, then we'll go to the 45 up, and I can check out the airspeed indicator, but we started around 140, and then I have them come off between around 60. With power, there's all sorts of, you can do a lot of different things. So you can cut power on the 45 and push it, or I usually leave power in, so at least it's moving forward uh, to give you a line in between that 45 up and then the spin. And then for the spin, the one and a half is, is fun because there's a couple dynamics that happen. So with the different spins that we've got, you're still tracking forward a little bit as it drops in. So the first half, you're going to be in, inverted, but still positive G and you feel it. And then when you get to one, you're still slightly positive on it. So that's where if you're doing a one turn spin, it's about 100 degrees prior to when you want to stop. I usually put in rudder and then around 45 feed the stick forward. And that way it'll blend in and you don't have to do that stop and push down. It just goes whoop and then you're right on it. Um, and then depending on your weight and balance, it changes slightly if you got two people in the airplane or heavy fuel or different things. There's a couple degree variance that you play with to get the timing just right. But you start there and it works really good. But once you get handy with a one turn spin, then we've got the one and a half turn spin and the dynamics change on it. And it doesn't, f it's the same point that you're doing the recovery at. It's 100 degrees prior, but it doesn't look that way. It looks like it's almost a full half turn. So what will happen is as the aircraft comes through, you go through your half, you go through one. And then it, it kind of does more roll than yaw initially. So the nose still looks like it's that way. But if you go by the bank angle, here's your 100 degrees. And so that's where people think like, we got to do it really early. And it's accelerating towards the fully developed phase. So as you get through that one turn and then the wing gets down, then you'll kick in rudder and ease the stick forward. And it ends up being about the same timing, but it looks, it feels like you got to do it really early. And the real challenge with these is with the one turn, you have to really push it forward to get it to come down. 
And it's not for the recovery, it's just to get it to look vertical for the competition style. With the one and a half, you're already at vertical. And so it's really easy to end up here instead uh, by a couple degrees. And with the judging, it's uh, five degrees off is one point, but on vertical, because of the perception, it's like two degrees off is one point. And you won't find it in the rules, but that's how it looks. And that's the same thing true with like wings being off. This looks really bad. That's one point off, but it's probably only two or three degrees. Um, Crap being nice square rectangular plan form wing. If you have it right, it's going to look good and it's going to grade good. If you have it wrong at all, you will have critique to make it better. Um, but <laughs> that's how that one's going to work. Uh, but that's where you're looking at that one and a half is it's going to feel like you have to go almost at one turn is when you have to kick and then ease the stick forward. But don't go as far as you do on the one turn and it'll line up perfectly on the vertical. The next part is making sure you don't overdo with rudder. So as it comes around, once you have the spin stopped and it's just kind of finishing, and this works good for the hammerhead, if you just back pressure off the rudders and then put it back on, the airplane will find vertical for you. Um, if you end up with a one and a quarter to give yourself a Y corrector, uh, those are kind of goofy because with the dynamics coming through, you end up kind of this way. And so if it was a left spin, uh, let's see, we'll go this way, we'll go left spin, come around one and then a quarter, you end up in this direction. So to fix it, you're gonna need rudder to the left again. I should do it backwards so you can see it, but you end up here. So you need left rudder to square it up, but that's the rudder you just had for spinning. Um, so in the past, we've kind of tried to avoid the one and a quarter in the sportsman sequence, just because it's one of those that if you get somebody too amped up, you know, you get adrenaline as you're competing and things. So you get really amped up, you're like, there it is. And you jam the pro spin rudder and you're going around for another half turn. Um, so stop the turn first, then rudder, and then it works out and you'll be able to blend it. You won't really see it if you're doing it right, but, but make sure the airplane, you can feel it. Cause that's the cool part with aerobatics. That's why I love aerobatics. You feel the airflow come across the wing. And suddenly the, the ailerons are working. The elevator is working. Like it's alive again. I'm not in that stalled region. The plane hooks up, and when you feel that, then you can do whatever you want. Um, so that's why I have my students wait for if we have that in it. But the one and a half grade really well. So that's why almost everyone in their free will have a one and a half, um, and it gets us turned around. Now, one thing I forgot to mention: 45s are a funny thing. Um, what's the best grade for a 45? Grade, score, yeah, no. <laughs> the book says 10. If you get anything above like a seven, seven and a half, you're doing really good. The joke, my, one of my mentors, uh, he helped us out with some aircraft work and doing some things and he went to a contest in California and he's looking at the grades because he wants to get better at this. And he passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. But um, by the time he's calling me up really angry, he's like, I talked to a bunch of judges and they just, they don't get it. I'm like, what will they get? He's like, well, the best grade's a 10. I'm like, no, it's not. It's a seven. He's like, what? I'm like, well, what did you get on your scores? So he's got one sheet that says too steep, seven. He's got another sheet that says too shallow, seven. I'm like, anything above an eight is bonus points. <laughs> like, they like you that day. I don't know. Or you made it look really good and just held it. Um, but that's, that's some of the challenges with 45s. You have to sell it more by style than necessarily the angle. You can go little bit steeper, but shallow is definitely shallow when you see shallow. Um, and that's just one of the challenges there. But if you get a seven or an eight, count it. And when you look at the scores, if everyone says you're shallow, okay, fix it. If everyone says and agrees you're steep, okay, you can tweak it a little bit. If you have a split thing and you're confused as to why you got a crappy grade, but the judges can't agree on which way it was, don't change anything. It'll be better the next time. Just let it ride and you'll get a good score next. Um, but that's one of the channels there. Okay, so we got out of our spin. Nope, we're spinning again. Uh, I want to back out and see what I can do about flight controls. Uh, if I could, uh, that's a little dark. But for the timing, I'll give you the timing one more time as we're going through it for the entry. Um, so capping off, waiting for the horn, count to three, rudder goes in, stick comes back, and that'll give you all the criteria. Here's one rudder stick now, and then that puts you right in. And you'll notice that the vertical is pretty much there if you check the wing on the far edge. It's um, interesting to get, it wants to be vertical. It's really, the most common one is to push too far and end up, a lot of my students have been doing this lately this season, like recover and end up like, okay, that was cool, we're floating. Um, now we've got our Cuban. One. Two, might have a little long. Might have been a little short after. Um, 
So with the, that was a, yeah, that was a Cuban, right? Not, not a wedge. <laughs> uh, so with the Cuban, there's going to be a couple different pulls, and we can apply this to any of the other maneuvers as well. You've got a, a radius pull, and then you've got a plane-to-plane -plane pull or a line-to-line -line pull. So when doing something like the end of the Cuban, or going into a reverse, or going into the, uh, the vertical for the, the Humpty Bump, the plane-to-plane -plane pull is you try to keep the nose moving at about the same rate. So you'll start with a certain G and then keep bringing the stick back to try to make similar G. And then when you unload hard, then it shows like I'm on the line. Um, and that works really. Same thing for 45s going up. It's the, uh, you know, start and it, it kind of, you almost accelerate to it. You're not adding more G though. You'll have more back pressure, but not necessarily more G. And that'll accelerate to the line and you can always unload hard because you won't really hurt anything when it's at zero. Um, so you can unload hard, but yeah, get it, get it there and then hold it. For the radius, you want to get the G in and, and have the stick position, and then you'll basically hold about the same stick position, and as the aircraft goes up, you'll slow down, and the G will back off, and the, the rate of change will be there, but it'll help you with the radius. Now, with an extra or something that maintains a lot of speed through the whole thing, um, that's actually a good starting point if you ever transition. Uh, first loop, just pull it to a position, hold it, and then it'll slow down and actually tractor across for you, and then come around. It won't be perfect, but it'll be close. Decathlon, you do have to float. So you'll, I don't go negative because then it stops and, and you, you end up with a line. Um, so keep the nose moving, uh, but you do end up floating, getting light about maybe just shy of 1G, so 0 0.8, 0 0.5. Let it accelerate. And that's where, um, in terms of acceleration, you want to make sure pass vertical. It's easy to float here by accident. So with sight picture, checking the wing, because if you have the horizon, you can do something about it. You know where you're at. If you're looking straight, there's just nothing but blue. So... As soon as you come up past 30, check the wing, come across the top, around here, so you're at least tractoring that way is when you'll float, get as much as you can, and then as you get to level, the airplane will start accelerating. So you want to seem like you're floating at the apex, but you're actually floating the first part, and then you'll start accelerating and bring it back as the aircraft accelerates. And then through the bottom, you'll accelerate more G, and you end up with about 0.2 to 0.5 more at the bottom than at, at the beginning because now you're fighting gravity, and that should get you close. If you end up high at the end, um, ironically, you need to pull harder at the beginning. Uh, if you end up a little bit low at the end, most won't actually see that in the grading. A little bit low, you know, 50 to 100 feet seems to be, that looks perfect. And if you end up on the same altitude, sometimes it looks E-shaped, depending on what the winds are doing and pushing you and trying to adjust for parallax and things like that. Uh, but that, that works really well. And then for air shows, uh, there's no reason to do round at the surface. So you go up and then do your loop and could recover high, but then you'll drive, do an approach after. But that's different, different style. Um, that, gets, uh, that gets that part. For the Cuban, the hardest maneuver is a reverse. So going up and rolling at 45, we can talk about those a little later. Um, but for timing, we have to balance cadence and distance, and the decathlon is one of the few aircraft where you can actually see the distance change as the aircraft accelerates. Um, if you look at some of the other competitors flying a pits or an extra, you can go in one, two, roll, one, two, and it looks about the same because the timing's there. For us, it is pretty much a two count, so you come across really slow, let it accelerate a little bit, roll around the point, and then one little bit, and then pull, and at, you'll see the aircraft accelerate in the sky, so that'll center it up. So it's kind of like a two to one type ratio for timing. Um, the other part is looking at um, rolling in general. So who loves rolls? All the different varieties of rolls that we can have. So we got slow rolls, we got aileron rolls. Those are good for showing somebody and not making them sick. You know, just bring it up and go ballistically and bring it around. So that's really comfortable. Then we've got our competition slow roll going through. Then you can start adding points to it. The most work you'll do is going level because now you got to work with gravity. Vertical, you shouldn't have any rudder. It's just aileron. You don't have to do anything weird with the elevator. You know, just, just keep it straight and go. Um, referencing while looking at the wing and doing that is weird. A lot of fun, but weird. But then the, you got the 45. So you'll need to do some work, but not as much as you do levels. So that's one of the common things is putting in too much rudder. The other one is putting in the wrong rudder. Because um, we're used to going upright, left, left, or at least left and letting the right, right rudder come in and come around. Um, so when inverted, 
you still have adverse yaw, so if I roll counterclockwise, if I was going to turn, I still need rudder on this side. It just happens to be your right side, so the feet and the stick are going to be backwards. So basically, when inverted, don't look at the nose. Find your spot for your 45. So I usually check the wing for the 45, and then going downhill, the ground's more important. So find your spot in front of you at that sight picture inverted. And then as you roll around that point, start with almost zero rudder, and then right here is where you'll start needing just a little bit of left to finish it off. Um, and then keep on that point. It's really easy to let the nose try to drift. So as you get around, it's probably going to take just a little bit of forward to keep the point. Since we got a two point on this one and starting knife edge, you just get a little bit of pause. Don't push in a lot of top rudder. It's not a two point going level. So it won't, it'll take a little bit, but not much. And then, then it'll be off of it pretty quick. So you'll need a little less work on the 45s than on the level in terms of flight controls. And that helps out. So we run through more, more primary and or sportsman. And the skills are same, same primary maneuvers. And then as we go through, I gotta think of what's after this one. I like hammer, so we do hammer next. The sportsman has some interesting, oh, it's, there's a, I can't read my own card. Oh, the one must have been a wedge. Wedge and then an Immelman. Okay, that's why I was looking at. Wedge, you go vertical and then, then come around. That's why I goofed it up. Little wiggle on the Immelman. This is where, this is where you gotta be sneaky. <laughs> this is where you'll gain power. Um, so the other maneuver right now, see, I think it was a wedge, it wasn't a Cuban. That's okay, wedge, stop. Um, anyone new to competition? Or new to, to some of the maneuvers? Awesome. So because of how it's drawn, people think you gotta like hook into it. It's, it's drawn just to make it fit on the page. Um, so anytime you see it like a hard edge, that's just to make it fit there. It needs to be a radius going to it. Uh, so, so you'll pull hard, get to vertical, unload it plane to plane. So you can actually accelerate it to vertical stop. And then as you come across the top, then you do need to start it before you get too slow. So you have to have energy coming through almost like a Humpty bump. So you can bump it, get it to fly a radius, not much of one, but something. And then you'll be able to stop it on the 45 down and roll. So you don't want to go till it ends and then fall into it because you do need to drive, drive an arc. And that, that'll look cleaner and give you more energy. Um, after that, this sequence has a couple different interesting things, which is uh, they're basically Immelmans that are into it. There's like one straight Immelman, and then there's the competition turn, followed by a down 45 into essentially another one where you're doing that roll on top. This is where you get to, to play. <laughs> um, so... You want to draw a radius and then you want to be able to fly across the top from it. So half loop up, fly away. Uh, when doing that, if you fly it just like a loop, what's your typical speed at the top of a loop? Darn near nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it's enough, it, that, that's it. But it's basically enough to keep the arc going as you accelerate. So you have almost nothing on top. And so typically when we fly a loop, um, I like slightly more than two and a half Gs, but you know, somewhere around three, three and a half works pretty well. Uh, for the Immelman, you need more energy. There's a couple ways of getting it. One is to start faster, um, but if you pull the same G load, you'll just make it bigger. So the other one is we need to add a little bit of G. Even though more G is more drag, you're in it for a lot less. So I know, um, uh, I'm gonna remember, oh, Barry Schiff has the articles about the impossible turn and turning around and altitude loss and He's like, yeah, if you lose an engine, don't, you know, shallow bank would seem great because you got more lift going up, but the turn is so long and so big, you actually lose way more altitude because you're not pulling harder. So you will we'll need to pull just a little bit extra and we'll pause for tri-motor. There it goes. <laughs> All right. And, and so what you'll typically want to do, is, and I don't fly this airplane super fast. I like doing loops around 140. And I, when I'm in competition, more is more, but I don't typically go much past 160 to 170 at most. When you get to close to V&E, you just start blowing panels and it's harder to fly it. Um, it doesn't fly any better faster. So some of them would go faster. Like, no, don't do that in the cap one. Uh, so I usually like, you know, 150, 160. For the Immelman, if you're solo, you can get it as slow as 140, but if you're two up, you definitely want 150. If you're solo, it's a lot easier with 150. So go into 150, pull a little bit harder. So closer to four, that'll get you around the corner faster. And then the next trick is a weird trick of aerodynamics that I'm trying to think if I want to draw it out or not. Um, who, who likes aerodynamics training? It's 
my students hate it when I start drawing lift curves and things. Uh, <laughs> my promise is this will be the reason why this works. And so I just need to get to my mouse and make sure that this screen is over here correctly. And hopefully it lets me draw on it. Find out if I got this working. Uh, oh. Right side, hey, okay, it's gonna be a weird drawing because I really need it on the screen. Okay, so we've got your, uh, your speed at the bottom. So you've got velocity, and then we'll have drag on this side. The curve makes that interesting arc that looks like this. So you've got your, your glide is over here, and then your minimum sink is down on this side. And when you're in slow flight, you need a lot of power again. And so that's if you're flying level. And I should have drawn it more steeper, but whatever. You need a lot of power when you're going slow, and it, it comes back up and shoots up at high speed. So the trick then is, in the book it says, go to inverted, pause. For, you can have a slight pause before rolling, and then fly away in level flight. So a lot think you've got to go to negative 1G, and then start rolling. If you do that, you have all the drag here. So instead about five degrees before you'd be at that slow flight level, put the stick in the center and go to zero. Because if you're at zero, all this drag is because of lift. It's all induced drag. So this goes away and your drag curve goes just from speed. So now all the power you have, instead of trying to keep, just keep you level and tractor it along, it's all accelerating you. So you pop it at zero, hit the aileron. Because you're ballistic, you don't need rudder initially. So all the threat of Immel spin or hammer spin or you know falling out of the maneuver, all of it goes away because you don't have rudder in and you're not jamming forward on the stick. You're at center, let it go ballistic. Now, you can't keep that indefinitely because then your, your Immelman will look like you're falling out of it. Um, but that'll get you around to about the first 90 degrees and the aircraft will accelerate. And then when you get to about 90, it's top rudder and then start easing the stick back to fly away in slow flight. And now the aircraft will be flying at around 70 to 80. Um, when I was flying the uh, um, Dick Swanson's aircraft, it's 8 Sierra Charlie with the Trailblazer prop, and his is set up to be very light, and with the new ailerons, I can actually be, after doing a, a two-point roll off the top, so 1-2, I can be at 110 by the end of that, which is stupid, but it accelerates. <laughs> and now you've got your speed for your comp turn or whatever you want. Um, or if you need to slow down for a spin or whatever you have and you're free, you've got choices and options. There's a lot more you can then do and you'll gain altitude. Uh, and so that's kind of how I make that work. And that's the, the aerodynamic background about why going ballistic helped out. Um, and I'll probably talk about that again on, on Friday too. Well, that's the wrong one because I want a video. So that gets us around that point. The next one is after this, do a slow flight steep turn. <laughs> So I, I personally like going to about 70 to 80 degrees because I can cheat the rest with rudder. Because if you're at 60, which is what we need, and you'd be at 60, it's questionable if it's too shallow or steep enough. And then when you pull, you have to pull the two Gs coordinator to be really close to it. If you go past, then you can fake it with rudder for the rest of it. And if you pull hard, it's not going to bring the nose up. And if you don't pull hard and want to make it big, you can try to finesse it with rudder. But you're going to be slow and draggy coming around. Um, so ideally we'll get some speed, but, uh, but we'll have to watch because the next thing is to go down 45. Because after that is this, uh, yeah, the reverse thing. So it's almost like an upside down Cuban. So you'll push, push down 45, accelerate to whatever you want. It doesn't need to be a long line. It just needs to be a line. As long as you hit the line, you can come off of it again. Hard pull because now it's like the bottom of a loop. So you'll be a hard pull, then float it, and then do the Immelman thing again, and you'll be back up and running. So that's really what we look at for the element in those couple figures. Questions so far? Thoughts? We doing okay? Other ideas for flying? I can show how I haul this thing through intermediate because I'm an idiot. Um, that's, <laughs> but that's how we make that part work. Um, and again, this is my student practicing, so it's not going to be perfect. We're, we're still learning as we're going through these maneuvers, but it, it, it does work, and you can kind of see where the airplane has energy or doesn't have energy. And on the speed, I'm looking at, yeah, we're only about 100, but hence our friend the Stallhorn again. And this airplane, again, it goes off really early, so it's just song of my people, um, but it works. So now we're going to stuff it.
Um, if you want to set yourself apart from other competitors, do not go gently into the down 45. Make sure your CFL site and just hit it and go 45 and lock. And then you'll be like, oh, they mean it. Um, and you won't lose as much altitude. If you go soft into it, you'll just do one of these weird descent things, and then you'll lose a ton of altitude. If you, you hit it hard, then you won't lose as much, and you'll have more energy coming out of it as well. And that doesn't look like the steep turn anymore, so I think we're gaining altitude to do that part because uh, we're practicing up high. I don't know what's happening now, uh, but practice video. So, um, yeah, Stallhorn again. Let's see if we've got... Uh, yeah, anyway, I want to see some of the... Now we're tractoring around. For some reason, this one didn't have a lot of climb performance on this day, so probably climbing up and messing around with that again. I don't know why we're not maneuvering. Doing more fun things. Oh, that's 45. I think we're working on spins. All right, so that's a little bit with, with that sequence and how those can kind of fit together. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else that's really tricky with... Uh, the sportsman, because I think from the card, that's this is why I like a three three sixty camera. I can just read the read the card. Um, I also have it on a file, but yeah. After that, yeah, split S. Ah, oh, that's a good one. That is something important to talk about. There's split S, and then is there a ham? Yeah, there's a hammerhead in it too. And then there's a roll, and rolls are that's the gateway. If you can get the roll down, everything else is easy. So for the split S, uh, it doesn't have a two. It does have a two of four. That's what makes that one a pain in the rear end. And it comes right after that element too. So we're going to have to accelerate a little bit. And this is where as a pilot, you're going to have to use some judgment on speeds and management and making it work. And I'll tell you where this gets stuck because it's really easy to get stuck on this maneuver. Um, so I like long pauses so that way they know that you did it. Um, so I do like to emphasize it. On this one, you do want a little bit of speed. So you can do it solo around 90 but if you're around 100 is a that 100 will work much past 110 it's it's a lot of speed coming out the bottom so i don't really like being that high uh, i think the poh says start split s is 130 like no that's a lot of g and all the speed so that's too close to v &E. um but around around 100 works out okay so pitch up hit it get a little bit of rudder in don't use too much if you try to hold perfectly knife edge with a lot of rudder What'll happen is the aircraft gets stuck in a slow speed slip and you use aileron and then nothing happens. Now in a contest, you're stuck with what you got. So you got a couple options. You either just did a really aggressive wing wag and you can start it again because you didn't go past 90. <laughs> or um, if you're like, nope, I'm committed. Everything else is good and we're doing this. Um, what you'll need to do is back off the, if you're going left, because that's usually where we go, back off the right rudder let the nose come down a little bit, and that aileron will start flying again and get you to invert it. Um, it won't be a perfect maneuver then, but it won't be a zero. <laughs> so at that point, we're just trying to make it work. Um, but the benefit of having the, the two of four is if you get stuck, you're like, oh, it was just a really aggressive wing wag. Do that two more times and you're fine. It'll go back to the right. It just might get stuck and go from going left. That's actually an issue sometimes with rolling a satabrias. Anyone roll satabrias? Learn satabrias? They get hung up if you try to use too much rudder. You got to kind of like ballistically roll it a little bit more. And they'll look really good from the ground if you do that. It won't look like it's your ballistically because it needs a lot of inverted when you're going through. But they, they have a habit of getting stuck. So get a little bit of speed. 90 to 100 works pretty good. Roll it. Do not overdo the right rudder because that's going to be our habit is to just keep feeding it in. Just hit the pause. Little bit of right rudder and then get the aileron in, and you might have to actually back off. In the normal roll, I'd hold right rudder all the way through this point, but when you're slow, it's gonna get stuck. So you back off a little bit, get it to roll, and then you'll get to inverted. And then the next part is you need to draw a radius. So the next hazard point is getting here and then pulling immediately to five, because it feels like that's what you need to. You need to let it float just a little bit. You don't want the speed to pick up, but you want motion that way. So if you wanna back off throttle a little bit, let it float, and then start getting on the G, and then get on close to, well, if you're fast, you're going to be about four and a half. Um, but the faster you go, the more effective the elevator becomes. So if you're normally used to pulling a certain point at three, if you are doing 170, you do have the capability of doing a lot more G than, than what you normally would. So you do have to kind of feel it, make sure you're keeping the Gs within. And when I do all of my stuff, whether or not it's doing something more exciting in terms of intermediate, or I did play with advanced once just to be silly, um, I, can, I keep, try to keep the G's all below 5.5. Five. 
Like I, I don't hit six. It's just it's, there's no need to. What's funny is that when my students get amped up, I can fly intermediate with less G load on the airplane than my students flying primary and sportsman. Because uh, they'll get all amped up. Like, oh, I'm like, I'll stop it from going. So like, you don't need 5.5 five for a 45 up line. Uh, <laughs> but after diving in the box, they get excited. Like, ah. So it's like, all right, sure. Um, but yeah, if you can be smooth and finesse it, you'll get a lot more performance out of the aircraft. And so a few places are... Uh, the trickier, the tricky spot is that split S. Then after that, it's easy. You've got a loop. Hey, we're looping. And then the hammerhead is where things get interesting as well. Um, it's all timing. I don't actually know what speed I use anymore. I think around about 35 to 40 works pretty well. So it's just below where the speed, speedo starts to actually have an indication. Um, but where I actually look is it's a little bit by feel, but also if you're checking the left wing, you'll see the, uh, the prop vortex shrinks up really fast. Uh, as you get slow, and it'll start to cavitate that inboard fabric panel. So when you start to see a flutter, that's when to kick. If you're first learning hammerheads, you can't tail slide it, but if you see that kick, you're probably late on it. But as soon as you start to see it flutter in your periphery, just full rudder, and then ease the stick all the way over to the stop. A lot of times, the aircraft, as it's pivoting, is going to try to go on its back, so then you usually feed in a little bit forward. And then in terms of sight picture, I'm looking at the wing. And then through here, I'm, I'm looking at the horizon. And as soon as I find the nose, I, I track it to a vertical point. And then getting it squared up is the next challenge. So it's really easy to overdo it and come back sideways or drag a wing slightly. So if you get that critique, the airplane does want to be a lawn dart. So if you let the airplane fly vertical, it will. So to do that, you'll, you'll recover with right rudder. Usually you might have to even go left aileron as you do that and square it up. And then once you get close to vertical, right before you hit it, if you release rudder and just very light pressure on anything, don't actually push it, it'll find itself vertical, and then you get back on rudders and you're square. Um, if you try to find it, that's where things get weird. And that works in decathlon, extra, the panzel, a lot of goofy things. It's really easy to try to over control it. Uh, so that, that's where that part's gonna be at. And then you got your roll. Now with rolls, that I have a video for. I like that part. Good question. <laughs> um, for rolling the aircraft, how slow can you roll? It's a decathlon, so pretty slow. <laughs> so we clocked uh, the red one. Okay, it hates me. That's fine. I got to get rid of, uh, that's right, I need to close that out. Um, the decathlon will do about 90 degrees per second. I have not done the math on an extreme decathlon or the modified one to see how it works. So I don't exactly know. Um, oh, okay, that's why it's a 360 video. We'll do 360, perfect. I see I have a different program for that. Uh, I haven't clocked the extreme, but the extreme style wings do roll faster. And they roll faster at a slower speed too. So coming out of the, the Immelman, you can, if you finesse it, it'll, it'll accelerate out of it faster, which is nice. Um, that's not, there it is. Uh, so that's kind of our normal roll or pretty close to it. It's about 90 degrees per second. So it takes four seconds to do it. Uh, and then my student wanted to see, I try to get him to, to get the controls right. So we decided to do essentially a, a super slow roll. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a hammer. I think we hammered to get turned around. So you can check the wing. And then where I'm looking is, is checking the nose here, and then I just kind of follow it through. And if we want to see the hammer, oof, sorry, hammer controls, I can look at that too. Um, what we want to see is a slow roll to see where all the controls are. So as you get into it, you can let the nose come up a little bit with adverse You don't need to feed in left rudder right away. And then you'll hold right rudder going through. And then we'll hold it going over the top. So right rudder through here until there. That's when you switch to left. Everyone wants to hit it right it's easy to put it in too early, but playing with them slow is, is good. So if you want the, uh, I shouldn't tell my MSU guys this. I'll give you the super secret for perfect rolls. All right, so a three-step process to make perfect rolls is uh, start number one, practice an aileron roll. Get the nose up 30 degrees, go ballistic, get to go around. What that will do is it's going to find your max roll rate, and it'll find your neutral position on the elevator. If it comes off heading at all, you're not neutral, and that's where you need to be at knife edge. Um, and that gets, for somebody new, that gets them used to kind of the upside down stuff and making things work. Step two, you can call it a two point or simply fly inverted. Go inverted, 
And then I don't normally look at the instruments, but go ahead and look down at the altimeter. See what finds level. Um, it's going to be slightly higher than your normal level line upright because you kind of have to do an egg shape between the angle of incidence and it being only semi-symmetrical and not perfectly symmetrical. So the nose does have to be higher and more nose towards the sky than it does when you're, you're upright. So find that point. Then memorize it. That is going to be your target point when you roll into it. And then after that, try a roll and make sure you're not too far off heading or, or too far off altitude. And once that works, then the next step is you can do a couple things. One, try it slower. You don't need max rate. And when transitioning aircraft, just go wherever you're comfortable with first, and then you'll be able to speed it up. Or number two, do a multiple roll. So try to get two or three in together. In the decathlon, the ailerons are going to kill about 10 miles an hour every time you go around until it stabilizes about 80. So you'll be really slow if you do more than like three. Um, I was bored. I had a student. Well, we were doing uh, summer campers in the decathlon, and one of the other pilots did like a 13 turn spin or something with one of the students. I'm like, I don't want to climb that high. We've been up doing a lot of things. I don't want to waste the altitude. So I would just do rolls. And she was like, okay. That's actually how I taught myself rollers. I ended up at the end of the practice area and had to turn around. So I'm like, we'll just do 13 rolls. So we started at 130, our good roll speed where you can use max aileron. And then we ended up doing them at about 80 by the fifth one and just dragging the aircraft around. Um, but if you do two together, any mistake you make in the first one is going to be multiplied on the second one. And then when you're looking, you'll see, oh, I need to fix it here. And then you start seeing the corrections you need to make. Stop for a second, recombobulate, and then do the, nut, the next one. And you'll kind of see where that, you know, maybe any air and rudder was going to be. Because when you go around slow, you need, you know, I let uh, the adverse yaw kind of help out. Because normally if you just hit aileron, it's going to kick out. Well, you need the nose up, so let it. Um, and, and if you do that, if it does kick out here, you can correct the heading by just a little bit of back pressure, and that puts you in perfect line, so you don't need to work with rudder. You don't want to pull the nose up. You don't need to work with rudder to get it to that inverted point. Um, and now that you've got that inverted slight picture, right, when you get past about here is when you'll use left rudder. And then when you have left rudder, our aircraft being a high wing with the rudder in is going to try to accelerate. Um, the first time you do it, don't think too hard about it. But eventually, as you get handy with it, you'll use your periphery vision to figure out your roll rate. And if that changes at all, you just change aileron. So as if it starts to accelerate, just barely back off. Don't like come back, but a little bit off. And then when you get to level, it's pop the center and it'll done and you're flying. Um, the first few times, you probably end up with left rudder and sideways at the end of the roll, but it'll still grade well as long as it was straight. Um, and then just slowly feed it out if you're in a contest. Don't like swing it, be like, I'm square now. Like, no, just, just let it fly and no one will see it. Um, but when you get handy with it, you'll back off. You won't need as much rudder. You'll back off as you go. The trick with flying to the Cathlon in more stuff is all a game of just enough. Um, you don't want to over control it because there's no energy to over control it. But once you figure out how to finesse it and it talks to you, then, then it's, it'll, it'll fly, it'll roll faster, it'll do a couple things. Um, with our green airplane, once I get the students tuned up in rolls, I have had comp or, uh, other competitors comment that they've not seen decathlons roll that fast before, other than in extreme. Um, we, can, we can't roll as fast in extreme, but we can get really close. And it's, it's just getting them to finesse it, not try to fist into it. Um, you got to get on the ailerons hard. Everything else is just enough. And once you've got that, everything works. If you're trying to correct for things, it's all drag, and it'll slow down the roll rate. Uh, so it's just kind of some neat, neat things how it all fits together. But if you want to slow down at all, and you will note that there is one thing that happens depending on how you roll the aircraft is um, around uh, it's inverted. If you're going slow at a high deck angle, it will start to get some flow that interferes with the rudder and it'll kind of do a weird jiggle about here. You might've seen it kind of pause a moment and then go, that was just being weird. That's more of our normal roll. Actually, it's still slow. It's just not super slow. Uh, and then we look at the hammer again. I can see if I can check controls, or if you can check the tail, what the tail does. Was I only flying? Oh, I was flying it to mess with my, that's right, I was demoing it. I did do it with a student, too, and ha had them do it. Uh, okay, the stick is there, and it's hard to see with the contrast, but that's fine. Back to neutral, and then at this point, as we kick, it's right stick, a little bit forward, and then usually right here, I come across and back to center as it squares up back off the feet so it actually lines up. It's really easy to drag a wing. Uh, so as you're kind of tuning up during practice when you do a hammer, 
just make sure as you pull, you check both wings and you'll find the, the right spot. Because the sliding device is not always perfect, especially if it's playing a seating position. Bit and it got stuck there and you, and you feel it buffeting. Um, but if you check the time code, which you guys can't see, it was 20 seconds to get her <laughs> really slow. Uh, we had, had some fun with it. All right. Now, if we want to talk weird maneuvers, I got all sorts of weird maneuvers or other things we can look at. Any questions so far? Thoughts? Comments? Critique? Concerns? Yeah. A lot of times, yes. And, and when using that, you can see, Rob Holland does it too. Um, so, you know, we're always taught hand on the throttle. Uh, but then everyone flies the decathlon with like hand on the roll cage. You need to tell a decathlon pilot so you hand on the and you just squeeze into it. Um, but, uh, but to pull straight, uh, it's really common in any of the acro or stick aircraft that um, usually we're stronger pulling straight. So everyone kind of pulls into their right side and it'll start to roll. And then people start thinking, ah, I'm smart. I'm not going to do that. So they lock their elbow, then pulling their left leg. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I've had both of those happen very common. So the easy way is you're not pulling with two hands, but if you check it, it's kind of like shooting. Uh, you know, then you'll ergonomically pull straight back and it's a little bit easier. So a lot of times when I'm, I'm pulling for a vertical, it's not that I need, pause for power. Um, it's not that I need two hands, but I'll, I'll, I'll check it and then go in that way just so the ergonomics works out. Cause if I'm pulling into a leg, this is like, that's weird. And if I'm pulling this, I'm like, no straight. And then it'll go straight. Um, so loops and competitive stuff works. If you check any of, and like I said, this goes all the way up to the tippy top. If you check Rob Holland's videos while he's doing things or the, the what I see, you'll watch him do the same thing. It'll be like, power check. <laughs> For snap roll. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's really common. Uh, and, if, uh, and I have the same art as an instructor. I some have students uh, fly a variety of aircraft. Some aircraft have really heavy um, elevators. So I've had a, a few students who are either of shorter stature or just don't have a, you know, have you ever seen the video of them doing the Harold Johnson doing the trimotor aerobatics? Those controls are heavy. I have no idea how ripped the guy had to be to do that. It's but anyway, um, you know, but it, like the a Piper Seneca gets fairly heavy if you don't have a trim just right or the CG just right, and you're not exactly on the right speed. And so they're like, well, my instructor always said hand on throttle. Well, if I move it here, like, well, if you have to go around, if you do this a few times, I think you can make it. Um, you know, you're not saving much time. I'd rather have the landing be nice than just smash it in because I have my hand on the throttle in case of a go around. Uh, but that's mine. I won't be a lawyer. I can lawyer that one up. No, <laughs> but yeah, two hands for the pull really helps ergonomically with the stick uh, just to, to make sure, because if you're, you're seeing things, you'll feel it before you see it then, and then it'll, it'll keep you straight. That's good. I thought I saw another question. Hand up, did you leave? Yeah. Uh, first time students, uh, stop when they get inverted during a roll. That's probably the most common one. Um, and if the airplane's gonna over G, it's usually an instructor that is, well, is either being too exuberant because I got a free ride, but no, usually it's actually teaching somebody rolls and they get stuck and they, they let them go too far down, downhill. Um, so a lot of times when students start rolling, you know, when we turn, it's aileron and you stop and then you, you pull. And driving, it's, you know, you get your position, you hold it, and you release. So, so as soon as they start rolling, they, they get to here and suddenly stop moving because they think it's going to keep going. Um, they won't tell you that's what they're thinking, but that's kind of the subconscious. I'm here. And then it's like, that's weird. And then they, they start getting light in the seat, and then they start relaxing. So even doing an aileron roll where you're, you're ballistic all the time, that's why I usually start with those. It's like, okay, you've seen inverted, and you need the stick over, and they'll, they'll keep going, and it's very little threat of anything. Um, but teaching slow rolls, they'll get to here, stop, and then relax, and the nose comes down. And so as an instructor, you'll need to stop it and, or, and get the aileron in. At that point, I don't, as long as the altitude's not a concern, we train way up high. I don't care that the nose is low. Just watch the speed. If you need to back off throttle, that's fine. Um, but, but yeah, I had one other instructor over G, and then now the airplane's in inspection, but it's coming through soon. Uh, but that's what happened. They got inverted, nose came down. They were talking their student through the recovery, but didn't block them. So the nose came more down. 
and then they saw the airspeed go up and were concerned about overspeeding it, which is also a concern. So they brought the throttle back, but they forgot that when you're doing 180 to 190 that the elevator is really effective. So they pulled to what they thought would be three and ended up at six and a half. I'm like, mm, don't do that. Um, but it's experience sometimes. But if you're aware of that, I usually try to brief everyone on that, but they were briefed by it somebody else but that's my responsibility anyway because i help manage it um but yeah it's just one of those things where that's probably the most common mistake is or the one that's going to cause the most issues is they get here and then stop and then relax and then because you started a roll at 130 is a great speed for it you can use max aileron being below va you start at 130 and if the nose comes down now you're 150 and if you go here you're gonna be close to vne so that's where as an instructor i'm like nope and then go back upright and then we're okay that is also the challenge with the split S. You are gonna to wanna to watch the speeds on that going through sportsmen. So if the nose comes down and you are not, you get above, I don't like going above 120 cause then you gotta pull really hard. You gotta mess with power a lot. If you, mess, if you pull power idle, it's not gonna to get too fast, but it'll be higher speeds than you like to see. Um, but if you're around 100, 90 to 100, get the roll going and don't overdo the rudder. You'll get it around and it'll be fine. So float just a little bit, just kind of squeeze into it, and then you'll be able to hook around the bottom and it works great. And then you'll end at about 160, which will be really good for a nice big loop and then your hammer after it. Um, but those are, are some of the common ones. That's the other one too on the split S is uh, starting it too fast or letting the nose come down. But that's the hazard we run into is you're going to gain about 50 miles an hour in a split S and lose 800 feet. So if you're already starting at 140, the bottom of your loop speed, but you're at the top of it, then V and E becomes a real issue. So that's where I push. That's actually the only time I knocked a student out. Everyone pretends like, oh, it got dark. I was passed out three times. Like, do you feel sick? No, you're not passed out. Um, but, uh, but the only time I had a student knock themselves out was we we're gonna do a split S, let his nose come down, got to here, and we were accelerating through 130 before actually pulling, and I said, no, and I pushed it to negative two. I said, all right, we're up, roll it upright, and I want them to recover. It's like, just roll it upright, reset, and then we'll go, and you won't get the push-pull effect. So instead, we're up here doing negative two, we level off to close to zero, and they go, speed looks good, and just yanked on it. And so we went from like negative one, negative two, to almost immediately to positive four, to positive five. I was like, well, that's cool. So normally in the decathlon, at those G's, it's not too bad. And as you acclimate to it, you want to strain. But at those G's with how I sit in it and as much experience, I basically like tighten the calf muscle or something. Or, you know, I talk through it and I harass them. So they're in there like, hut, hut. and I'm like, yeah, you should pull harder <laughs> or whatever. It is. You know, I just whatever. But this time I was like, we're just negative too. Like, OK, so I'm like, Ooh. and then I watch them. They get and they get like. They get a little re relaxed. We're about here going down, but the trim is fine. So I, I know the airplane is going to recover up. So I don't even take control. I'm just like, well, this is dumb. So I'm here and I watch them relax and I watch them pop back up and do the crazy chicken thing. And then uh, like, welcome back. <laughs> How you feeling? <laughs> okay. I'm like, cool. You want to try that again or you want to go back? I'm going to try it again. I'm like, you sure? No, I want to go back. I'm like, good idea. Um, but that's, that's, you know, push pull effect, you know, that early in the season or, um, or as you're getting into some of those maneuvers, that's just something to be vigilant for. Because if you are hanging out upside down, your body doesn't realize it, but your head's like, I have too much blood flow. So I'm going to open up all my blood vessels and your G tolerance feels like it's half. I'm sure there's a medical doctor that has a paper on it that tells you exactly what it is, but it feels like half. And if you think about the G change going from negative two to positive five, is a 7G change. Going from positive one and trying to max out the decathlon, at positive six is only five. Uh, so, so it does feel like you're, you're not over it, but you, you get beat up as if you are. You've, it, it's more like an unlimited type airplane. It's not, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of G and it's a long pull. So those are things to watch out for at the beginning of the season, you know, staying hydrated, working into the higher G. And for us with a super D, the higher G is four and a half. Um, but the number is not really important. The ergonomics makes things a lot different too. Uh, your friends that have more monoplanes that are pulling six and eight, um, usually if I take a student from the decathlon and toss them in an extra, the first time they pull because the controls are light is gonna max it out. They usually accelerate stall or pull right to seven and a half to eight in, in, the, in an extra 
because the controls are lighter and it doesn't actually feel that bad. Um, if you're slightly reclined, uh, six to seven and an extra feels like you're doing four and a half in a degree one because we sit straight up. So we have zero advantage and the pits guys have the same issue until you start getting into like the 11 or I think some of them have done weird seat rigging things to try to make them recline if they built their own S1 and modified it a lot. Um, I, I don't know all the pits very, but the uh, monoplanes definitely with a recline seat makes a huge difference on how the G feels and, and how the periphery changes and if you get some of the G effects if you're not on the strain. Um, but those are just kind of different different flying things. All right. Other thoughts? Questions? Yeah. Oh. To the right side? Um. Yeah, finesse it to get it to go. Uh, does it still have the wood spar? Okay. That might be, that's not the reason, but I, they changed the dynamics a little bit when the, the, the metal spar is a little bit stiffer. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, well, yeah, with two, yeah, two up, the, the CG changes, and it, what, what motor do you have in it? Okay, so it's the, yeah, so it's light. So, um, the CG is good, though? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know if there's a, a, a rigging thing or if it's um, just where it might need, if you tried it with a, just a little bit of power to get the rudder, yeah. So you don't need to go, like, a full power on, but those are fun, too. I go about... 30 degrees nose up, full power on, and then wait, and then eventually drop it in. Um, so you try power on, or with power off, try just a, a little bit of power to give you a little bit more rudder. Um, there was a, a story that uh, my coach was telling me um, that at, at camp, the Morrisseys, and they had an issue where one of the aircraft or one of the competitors was flying, couldn't get it to snap or spin correctly to the one side. So they had someone in the put some in the cockpit and then push the rudders both directions and it it had all the travel one direction and only partial travel the other i don't think that's your problem but it's the, you know if you're looking at all holistic possibilities uh, you know rigging rudder travel um tensions on the cables and then uh try just to uh i don't like spinning cessnas but we've got a cessna 172 we've got set up for the utility category it's a 1,000 equipped, so we pulled the back seat out to make the CG work right. And it's really 50, actually NASA did a study. They said it's about 50-50 to see if you can get it to actually go into a spin. So what I found is if I zero thrust it, just add like 1,200 RPM, then that's enough flow that I can now have full control to get it to spin whichever way I want. It's not ideal if you're trying to do a power off spin, but that's our power off is with just a hair of power. The decathlon, I haven't had an issue, but if you're having one way or the other, you could check if one of the wings are heavy, too. We once had that problem where it'd spin really good to the right, but wouldn't spin well to the left, and, and there was added weight in one of the wings um, unintentionally. So I was like, all right, we'll fix it. Um, just goofy things that happen. Other thoughts, questions? Well, yes, snaps. Yay, snaps. So um, at your own risk, I will not be liable for any snap roll issues. Um, with that said, uh, they read it. The 90s tanks were kind of garbage. ACA admits they were kind of garbage. Um, in 2004, they redesigned them. I don't know if they had any old stock they're putting in 2004 models specifically or not. So if you got an 04, that's not a guarantee. But after 04, they did redesign the tanks so the baffling is better. Usually the failure point was there are some tack welds or spot welds in the baffle to make it stronger, and when the fuel would hit it, those would sometimes pop. Um, I've also known pilots that said, I have never ever snap rolled mine, and the tank still broke, because even doing maximum aileron rolls, there's enough slosh sometimes to get those to pop or fatigue out over time. It really depends on the, the timing. Uh, the max speed used to be listed fairly high. It really should be below 90, and they are not gonna be a Sean Tucker, Rob Holland snap. It is a decathlon, it is going to be blorpy and ugly, and that's just how it's going to be. Um, so if you fly it as the plane it is, it, it'll work, and there's not a lot of G-load or stress on it, as long as you keep it confined to what it is. Um, so typically, if I'm gonna do snaps, ours are a 2010, I have had issue, well, 
We had to replace uh, two tanks on that. One was a couple hours ago. We have about 4,000 hours on the machine, and none of them are easy. The easiest flight was me running full throttle from Grand Forks to Oshkosh. That was like its easiest flight that it's ever had. Usually, we're beating it up continuously. So to put 4,000 hours on it, and it didn't crack at the baffle, uh, there was a, a weld in one of the corners that had an issue. Um, so I talked with our maintenance. They're like, that's not snaps. We know what snap rolls cause, and that's not, it's just wore out. Um, another time we had one where there's that, that strap that keeps it in, in uh, the metal part of the strap had folded under and then skipped the rubber part, and it actually wore a hole after about 1,500 hours in the back of the tank. So it wasn't even like a weld breaking or something like that. Um, so I'm not going to say I've never had tank problems, uh, but I, we, I, I also don't train nonstop with snaps in that. I'll do a handful of them at a contest, and that's about it. Uh, but if you do want to play with it a little bit, avalanches are nice to it. Those aren't too bad. Um, you'll come in about 160, pull hard, and then you have to unload, pull, and then give it rudder. And then, uh, so what you're trying to do with a snap roll is, uh, well, I don't know if you, everyone wants the aerodynamics of snaps, but uh, some talk about it as an accelerated spin. It's not really. A spin, you have both wings stalled. A snap roll, you're stalling out one of them and letting the other one fly it around, which is why it rolls faster. Uh, so when you pull, you want to pull about to right before the stall point. If you're not sure where that is, just do a power off stall and you'll find that it stalls about an inch before full back. So you pull right to that point where the buffet, right before the buffet would be, get there and then give it rudder. And so what's going to happen is that immediately puts you at close to critical. And as you hit rudder, it's going to start because you push rudder, rolling it a little bit and that's going to stall out the inboard wing and then it'll start flying around. Um, if you just hold those controls, it'll go around. And then when you stop it, it's kind of like stopping a spin. It'll be opposite rudder and then bring the stick forward. Uh, and that'll be a bit, what it'll look like is this. It'll come up and it'll go blah, and then up about there. Um, if you want to accelerate it then, the outside wing's still flying and your ailerons still work. And then you can gyroscopically do some stuff where, kind of like a figure skater, if you've got all the energy going around this way, if you add a little bit of forward stick, it moves the motor and the rest of the fuselage together and it'll go just a little bit faster. So that's the next part of acceleration. Um, so if you pull back rudder and then if you're going left, just stick your hand right into your, right before your knee. And that'll accelerate, it'll come around. And then when you wanna stop, you'll rudder, pull back forward and it'll, and then it takes, there's inertia to it. So it's gonna take about, You'll start when you think you're at half, and by the time you get the controls in, it'll be about that 100 degrees. <laughs> uh, and that usually stops it. Um, but if you're doing an avalanche, you are close to stall up here. So I usually unload a little bit, pop, and then go, and it'll come around. And those are, are a little bit more gentle. A lot of times you end up off heading a little bit, so just relax and let it fix itself and then and fly through. So that's kind of the, the snap rolls with it, is you have to be slow. So I usually put mine, I set my own max snap limit to about 80 um, and I try to keep it at 75 and they look dumb and blurpy uh, but there will be no doubt it snaps because a decathlon cannot roll that fast when you do one with ailerons alone um, and that's actually where the misnomer of slow roll comes from is is early well up until you got to the MX and the extras and full span ailerons and carbon fiber wings the fast way to roll is with rudder it's a, a snap roll. So this, even if you've got a 300 degree roll rate, is slower than if you pop it and kick it, it'll be faster. So, so that's why it's a slow roll. It has nothing to do with going slow or partial to flight. It's, you can hammer it still slower than snapping it, um, but don't snap it fast because things will break. It's a decathlon, it, it won't like it. Now, if you want to see some video of how that works out, uh, let's see, I have it sitting. Well, this one's advanced. Nowhere to go. Two seconds. There. There we are. Got it. Uh, this one's the unknown. This was highly entertaining for me. Um, this is unknown at nationals last year. It started inverted, so we were slow. So they missed the wing wags, but that's fine. Uh, roll up right on the Y, and then it was a spin and a quarter. And because I'm big and giant, they were able to film really close. Uh, so so look good. There's our spin. Here's where the quarters can get weird, so you have to kind of play with rudder a little bit to square it. And this one is a 78 
with uh, extreme wings and a trailblazer. So the energy was pretty good on it. Um, and then it had a, a quarter up, and then we had to do a rolling turn. And rolling turns are entertaining. But if you get a really good roll, and you're good at doing the, the comp turns, both upright and inverted, then the rolling turn is making lift go where you want it to. So if anyone wants to talk to me after about rolling turns, we can talk about it. Um, but you do have to get some speed, so it took me a while to catch up. And then it's feeding in rudder and getting it to roll around and turn to go the other way. And then, like I mentioned, the next part was is a big figure eight thing. So you have to push forward. So stuff it, and then it looks like you know what you're doing. It, on the video, it looks a little steep. Didn't feel like in the aircraft, but it graded okay. But you got to get it and let it happen. So that way, you're not wasting energy in the arc. You hit it and go. And then we've got our two-point roll. And then I'll come around back to inverted and fly away. Um, that is trying to work the radius work. And the nice part is, like I said, the decathlon, when it's flying, it's a big rectangular wing. If you fly it well, it will be well rewarded. If you don't, you'll get really good notes about how to fix it because it will be very evident whatever is going on. If any of the angles are off or things, you can hide and cheat stuff a little bit. Um, and when flying it hard, sometimes I, I do cheat. I'll go steeper or shallower or something to manage speed and G load. Uh, intermediate, I don't really need to, but anything air show stuff or playing with it, that's why you'll, you'll, if you're a competitor and watching, it's like, that's not 45. Like, no, it's not. The ground's there. I don't want to do that. I just want to accelerate. So, um, so we play with those types of things. I think that was the avalanche. Yeah. So, um, so I sometimes will flatten it out a little bit just to not flatten it, but just back off the G sum so I can get more elevator to get it to, to actually go around. Uh, another 45, then we'll roll, then hold the line, and that's where as it accelerates, it's going to want to pull up, so you have to keep it and keep focus. Don't worry about how the stick feels, just keep that spot. Um, and that, that's how you'll make sure you keep that 45, because uh, a lot of times as soon as you roll upright, it wants to drift. So Humpty Bump, so you got to see the uh, really small arc on top, and, and you can watch the G accelerate. And then here's another hammer. And they look great when you hammer them. Um, just don't let it get too slow. If you hammer too fast, it'll, end, it'll close low. If you hammer too slow, it'll close low. So to say it closed low, that doesn't mean you were too fast or too slow. You'll have to figure out kind of for yourself what it did. Um, and then this is the other weird snap roll they had. So to make sure I can fly away, I did start it really early. So right there, float, go. And there it goes around. And it held. It doesn't hold as well with the normal metal prop, but the trailblazer will hold. So that, that'll work. And then wagon. Um, yeah, with the snaps and intermediate, they kind of moved them to kind of the avalanche style. So that way, if, if we want to partake at some point of playing with those, then we should be able to. Um, we do have to watch on the unknowns, the uh, energy and making sure the sequence will actually fit. If we have to take a break, we gotta take a break, but um, just to make sure we got altitude because we'll, we'll lose a little bit. Uh, when looking at an unknown or any sequences or freestyles and designing, um, some tips that work out pretty well is plan on losing a couple hundred feet for the Cuban. Um, you can do them with zero loss, but I, when you're first starting, plan on 200 feet. Uh, for the half loop up in an Immelman, you'll gain about 500 if you finesse it. If you go down, you're going to lose about 800. Um, so if you plan on that, that gets you in the ballpark. And then depending on how hard you pull and things, you can make those numbers work for you and your aircraft. Um, our aircraft do fly different. That one climbs great. The red one doesn't climb for some reason. So I'm waiting till we burn out the engine and can put a new one in it. So we're almost a TBO. And then we'll do a core swap, and then hopefully that fixes it. Um, and there's some rigging things we've always try to finesse and change, but those are just some different parts to it. But other thoughts, concerns, questions? Rob's hanging out grinning. All right, well, cool. Thank you for talking about, well, let me yell at you about decathlons. Yes. You said you had neck brakes. How did they find you? Was it maintenance saw? Did you saw it on pre-flight somehow? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It was us on pre-flight. If you start seeing a blue stain, that's probably it. We have had, actually, I should... Blue stains aren't necessarily the wing tanks. Um, I have had fittings come off the header tank, and I have had the, the fittings that go through the, the lines do things too. And if you do have fire and rescue uh, come to a contest, 
I always be sure to grab one of them and show them that the fuel lines go through the A pillar because that's right where they'd stick the jaws of life. Um, so I'm like, that's gonna hit the fuel line and then you'll be mad and I'll be mad, I'll be madder. But <laughs> it's like, don't, don't do that. Um, we've been safe, ne never knock on wood, not accidents at you know, contests or anything. But, uh, but yeah, it, air show groups and, and if you do have a contest where the locals are out and you've got that fire and rescue support, I usually point that out because that's usually right where they start breaking uh, car doors. I'm like, yeah, there's a hinge there. Just yank that up. Don't don't try to jam that part of the door. Plus, it's fiberglass, so just jam through it. I won't care. Um, but that, that's an interesting one. But I have had those fittings come out. I have had the header tank fitting get a little loose. The nice part with the header tank, it's a double tank. So if it ruptures inside, it's going to dump out the bottom of the aircraft and not on you. So I don't know if how many are familiar with that one. Um, but those are things things to look out for and check out. But yeah, you'll find it on the root of the wing. It'll start getting a little bit blue. And you're like, why is that there? And then, yes. Oh, good. Um, for my students, we have a really busy area. So our floor is 3,500 AGL and higher. And then once I get them confident and comfortable with the aircraft, then we run them to, I have an aerobatic box. I'll run them down to 1,500 and do sportsman and, and primary at the proper floor. Now, because we're bigger than everybody else, I their actual floor is 1700. <laughs> it's like I know the book says 15, but you'll look low at 17. So I have them keep a little bit higher. And that's uh and I always tell them that's not a safety concern or me being concerned about them. It's you will grade better and give them no like is that low? You know, cuz then they start thinking low, they stop grading the figure accurately, you know. So it's like just give them no question and be up above 17. But we we train at 35 and higher. Um, so usually we, I start spins and stuff around 5,000 and we do that and that, that keeps everybody happy and it allows aircraft to zip out under us and we can make gun passes and make noises at them. Um, but that's kind of what we do typically in training. But good question. Yeah, I'll hang out for a few. I know someone else is coming up at 1130, so I got to get kicked out. If you want to see a comparison of the aircraft or other weird videos, I'll, I'll play that as people exit and things. Um, otherwise, otherwise, yeah, thank you.